Good evening and welcome in to our Wednesday night Bible study. It is May the 20th, 2020. And uh, again, thank you for joining us for our midweek Bible study. Appreciate it. You honor us by uh, coming in to our broadcast <clears throat> and viewing what we have. Just a, a reminder that we are here uh, Monday through Friday, 9 a.m., and that is called Morning Coffee with Pastor Brian. It's a 15-minute devotional. Uh, this week we've been talking about healthy minds and addressing some of the things that uh, could uh, be in, uh, something that we're dealing with within our church world today. Anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, a bevy of mental health issues. So again, uh, we're trying to get some good resources out to help folks. So if you know anybody, maybe this doesn't affect you, but if you know somebody uh, within your circle of influence that might be able to help, please be sure to look at that information. And then Sundays at noon, we're live from the sanctuary uh, at uh, noon uh, on Sundays with just a brief 20-minute exhortation. Um, so again, we invite you to join us. Um, start a watch party with these videos if they're a blessing to you. Share them. Make comments like uh, our page if you haven't, and then of course uh, like these videos. And again, it's not about us and getting any glorification. We're just trying to build an audience and help people. Coronavirus, COVID-19, isolations, quarantines, all the uncertainty. Uh, we just want to step in and be a positive voice <clears throat> during this season of our uh Life, uh, world history, not just U.S. history, but certainly it's a world history that we're all living through. Just think generations from now, uh, our our time is going to be in the history books, you know, and we're going to look back. Uh, the, the generations coming are going to look back, just like we look back today in history books at Pearl Harbor or the Civil War, uh, apartheid, things like that. So uh, we're, we're going to be in the history books. For future generations, so keep that in mind. And uh, we're, like I said, we're just trying to, during this history making time, we're just trying to be a positive voice. So we've been talking on Wednesday nights, the last couple of weeks, about Pentecost. The reason is, on May 31st, which is the last Sunday of this month, it's Pentecost Sunday. The word Pentecost simply means 50, okay, 50. And uh, 50 days after Jesus was crucified, uh, the experience of Pentecost began. And uh, we've been looking at last week at the Old Testament how that 50 days after Passover, when they came out of Egypt, that uh, God gave them the law on Mount Sinai. And the Bible says the mountain was all together on fire, and there was smoke, there was earthquakes. And so we last week put the pieces of the puzzle together, Passover to the giving of the law, crucifixion of Jesus, until the Pentecostal experience began in Acts second chapter. Two weeks ago, we talked about the historical society, uh, side of it, that uh, in 1901, there was an outpouring of the Spirit, which began a uh, modern revival of Pentecostalism. Although it's been, since the Bible days, it's been happening. We, we do know that uh, in Topeka, Kansas, at Stone's Folly, they specifically uh, sought after being spirit-filled with the evidence of speaking in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And it happened there, and then it spilled over to Los Angeles to Azusa Street, and it was quite uh, an outpouring of God that continues to today. Thousands of people from all walks of life, all denominations, have received the gift of the Holy Ghost speaking in other tongues, and it's for uh, anybody and everybody, okay? So tonight my mission, my goal, my assignment is to show you from the Bible, uh, again, just some things about Pentecost, um, trying to clear up maybe some confusion, misunderstanding. Uh, you know, people sometimes mistake the outpouring of the Holy Ghost and the gift of the Holy Ghost with the gifts of 1 Corinthians 12 that Paul talks about, but understand that the church at Corinth uh, and the letter to Corinthians, this, this was an established church that had already been baptized in Jesus' name, repented of their sins, and had been spirit-filled. And so Paul is writing them a letter concerning 
what's going on in the church already after they had been spirit filled. So uh, don't confuse the gift of tongues and interpretation, 1 Corinthians 12, with the Pentecostal experience throughout the book of Acts uh, as it continues today. Thousands upon thousands from all walks of life, all denominations have experienced Pentecost. And I might say it's, it's for you and me today, and we'll, we'll examine a, a scripture. So again, our basis comes from Acts 2, 1 through 4, when the day of Pentecost was fully come. Again, the ancient Jewish feast day, they were required three times a year to come to Jerusalem to celebrate the feast, this being one of them, the Feast of Weeks, uh, the Feast of uh, First Fruits, the Feast of, uh, of this Pentecost. And it says they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind It filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them clothed in tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance. Amen. And so uh, May 31st is going to be Pentecost Sunday in our church uh, at 8965 Route 162 in Troy. We're going to do a drive-in service at 11 o'clock, and you're welcome to come. And we're going to celebrate Pentecost. And we're going to believe that uh, people are going to receive the Pentecostal experience just like they did in Acts 2, 1 through 4. Uh, let me give you some more background Old Testament wise. Isaiah 12 and 2 and 3. Again, I will not read every scripture that comes up tonight because it's just too much. Uh, but you can go back and view this and search them out. Or if you've got questions, you can send me a direct message. Call the church at 618 667 6054. We'll connect with you. We can have a Bible study and share more with you. But Acts, uh, I'm sorry, Isaiah 12, 2. And three, starts talking about, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid, for the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. Therefore, with joy shall you draw water out of the wells of salvation. So Isaiah begins to lead us to this notion of salvation. And he equates it to that it's water, right? That, that there's a, 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 a well of salvation and we can draw water out and be saved. And this is going to be important because Jesus, uh, several times in the Bible, and we're going to look at those tonight, he talks about uh, how that this Pentecostal experience or the salvation is like water. Okay, so this is why we're starting here in Isaiah 12. Joel 2.28 uh, says this, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Okay, so the thing to remember here, this is the promise of God. This is noted as the promise of the Father. The Father is saying, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. The word here shall come to pass afterward. We're going to examine that as uh, Peter preaches this exact same message in Acts the second chapter. So the Father, the promise of the Father is, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaidens in those days, I will pour out my spirit. What a great promise. Amen. And I might say this, I had my own Pentecostal experience as a young man uh, at Wapella, Illinois, Illinois District Campground. I uh, believe the year was 1972, Ju July of that year. Uh, I had my own Pentecostal experience on Illinois campground and what an experience it was just a young man and it stayed with me and I stayed with it more importantly throughout my life Isaiah again uh, this Old Testament prophet centuries before the, the uh, initial outpouring of the Holy Ghost uh, through God he says this for with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people to whom he said this is the rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest and this is the refreshing Okay, so this ancient prophet of old, he, uh, through the lens of prophecy and foretelling the future, he says that, that there is going to be a time when there will be stammering lips and another tongue, not a native tongue, not a learned tongue, uh, a heavenly language that is going to be used to speak not just to his people, but through his people. So you can see again, as we looked at Old Testament symbolism and uh, met metaphorically how that uh, Pentecost was addressed in the Old Testament, we see it as well 
in these scriptures tonight through Isaiah and Joel, speaking about this Pentecostal experience. And, and the particulars are now here defined. Joel said, the promise of the Father is, I'm going to pour out my spirit upon all flesh in the end time. Isaiah identifies how that that is going to sound and look, and he says it's going to be with a stammering lip and another tongue that this is going to come. It's called the refreshing, okay, and a rest. Very important. Now, uh, lest one thinks that Jesus was detached from the Pentecostal experience, that is not true. For Jesus said in uh, his teachings, right, for instance, in Mark 16 and uh, 15, he said, Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now notice, Jesus said, He that believeth, okay, and is baptized shall be saved. We can continue that thought uh, when it gets into 17, these signs shall follow them that believe. Are you a believer? I'm a believer. Okay, so believers are baptized. Secondly, believers shall speak with new tongues. Now, it's right here in your in your Bible. It's in my Bible. It's a red letter. Again, I'm not going to say trust me. I'm going to say go to your Bible and get Mark 16 and 17. And it says, these signs shall follow them that believe. They shall speak with new tongues. The tongues that he's talking about is the same thing Isaiah was talking about in 28, 11, and 12, that with another tongue would he speak to this people. So again, the Bible is coherent. The Bible doesn't contradict itself, and the plan of salvation is found throughout the Bible. And uh, Pentecostal experience is found throughout the Bible. And it's just a mattering of us uh, connecting the Old Testament and the New Testament, connecting all the pieces of the puzzle to realize, amen, that this great Pentecostal experience, um, that prophets of old talked about it, and Jesus talked about it, and it's still occurring today. Uh, so we can even look at John the Baptist, the forerunner to Jesus Christ. In Luke 3.16, John answered, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh. And he goes on to say that he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Now, in Acts 2, when we read that, remember that it said that when they were filled with the Holy Ghost, there was clothing tongues like as a fire that set upon each of them. Okay? So John is making this uh, analogy here as well. When the, when the Holy Ghost comes, it's going to be with Holy Ghost and fire. Now, I want to I want to clarify something. Not every time, in fact, I have never seen it when somebody receives the Holy Ghost. I've never seen the fire involved, okay, at least literally. Now, I have seen it supernaturally. I have seen it in the spiritual realm. But I've never seen clothing tongues like a fire sitting on somebody. I've never seen that. That doesn't discount what the Bible says, nor does it discount the experience of those receiving it without the fire uh, being resident, you know, physically, uh, visibly, but it doesn't discount it that supernaturally in the spiritual realm, when we're filled with the Holy Ghost, there's fire involved in that great experience. Uh, what what else does Jesus say about this? Uh, one of my all time go to passages is John, the third chapter, beginning at verse one through verse eight. A ruler of the Jews, Nicodemus. He was probably on the Sanhedrin court and the council, right? And he comes to Jesus by night. And, you know, he's a believer. And Jesus cuts to the chase and gets right to the point and said, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus didn't understand this. He thought he was talking about being born naturally a second time. That's not what Jesus was talking about. Jesus was talking about a spiritual birth, being born again spiritually. And Nicodemus says this, How can... A man be born when he is old, right? You know, I'm an older man. How, how is this going to happen? And uh, can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Obviously not. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of spirit, he can enter the kingdom of God. Uh, so we have this great Bible study that Jesus gave Nicodemus, who came to him in the middle of the night. And Jesus simply says, you must be born again. What does that mean? Well, Jesus said you're born again of water and of spirit. Okay? So this is leading up to this great experience of Acts. This is what Jesus taught. taught Nicodemus taught his disciples. 
and promised that this was going to happen. Uh, I referenced earlier Isaiah talking about how that salvation was a well, like a well of water, and we could draw out of it and be saved. On two occasions, John 4, 13 and 14, and John 7, 37 and 38, Jesus alludes being saved to drinking water. In John, the fourth chapter, he is with the woman at the well of Samaria, and it's Jacob's well. There is a long dialogue between the woman of Samaria and Jesus as they're sitting at Jacob's well. But in essence, in John 4, 13, Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. You're going to take a drink of Jacob's well water, you're going to be thirsty again. But he said, Whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall nev never thirst. The water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up in everlasting life. This is, this is the Pentecostal experience. Amen. It is a well of water that's just springing up into this everlasting life. And we can also tag in on that in John 7, 37. Jesus said in the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And John uh, goes on to say in 739 that Jesus was speaking about the Holy Ghost. Amen. He was speaking about the Holy Ghost that was not yet given. And uh, this is what the words of Jesus was concerning the Holy Ghost, that it's going to be uh, flowing out of our belly rivers of living water. Amen. And so what a great experience that's for you and for me. For my family, your family, your church, my church. And as we're approaching Pentecost Sunday, there's no greater time than to study this. And not only to study it, but to seek. I want to encourage you, if you've never been filled with the Spirit, the Bible way, uh, the Acts 2 way, uh, the Jesus way of John 3, I'm telling you, it's, it's for you. And you can seek for it like they did at Stone's Folly. In Topeka, Kansas, in 1901, they actively sought to be filled with the Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. My friend, this is a promise for you today. Hallelujah. For you, your church, your family, you can experience today. Uh, and and it is a wonderful experience for all of us to have. Uh, Paul, and, and you say, well, you know, the Holy Ghost is, uh, is, this, is this 1 Corinthians 12 gift. No, it's not. It, 1 Corinthians 12 is totally different uh, in its operation and administration. You say, well, it's only for extra special good people. Only certain people can get it. No, the promise of the Father, Joel 2.28, was I'm going to pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. Amen. Nobody's exempt today. Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 6.19, Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you? Come on now. That's as plain as day. Paul writing here in 1 Corinthians 6.19, he declares this body is now the temple of the Holy Ghost. Why? Because in the Old Testament they had a temple. And before they had a temple, they had a tabernacle, the tabernacle in the wilderness. And, and in that tabernacle and in that temple, uh, there was the Ark of the Covenant, which was the presence, the glory, the Shekinah, the anointing, the power, and the mercy of God. Amen. Was there. And uh, the only only once a year could the high priest go in the holiest of holies on the day of atonement and enter the presence of God. But when Jesus was crucified, friend, that veil in the temple was rent, and mercy was uh, the, the the veil of mercy was thrown open to everyone. Everybody could partake in the mercy and the gift of God. And now Paul, who was uh, very well educated in all the law and in all the rabbinical things. He is teaching and he is saying, What? Know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost? That old temple, that old tabernacle was replaced, amen, when the Holy Ghost came in to those men and women in the upper room, devout Jews who believed in the temple and the tabernacle until Jesus came. And now their bodies house the power and the presence and the anointing of God. Amen. The temple of the Holy Ghost. And it is in you. Jesus would go on to say in Acts 1 and 5, John, truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Amen. What a powerful experience uh, to, today. And uh, it is for you and me. And uh, again, another Old Testament 
uh, analogy to this Paul makes in 1 Corinthians 10 and 1 and 2. He says, Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So what I'm what I'm transitioning to here is the notion and the idea that the the the, the Holy Ghost, while it, when it comes upon us, we speak in other tongues. The notion is, according to the teachings of Jesus and John and Paul, is that there's a baptism of the Holy Ghost. I mean, that's completely immersed, completely doused, soaked. Right? It's just like the windows of heaven are opened up and poured out upon us. And so we have this notion, and it goes all the way back even to Moses when they came out of Egyptian bondage, that they, they, th there was the cloud that, that went before them uh, by day, and it was a, it was a uh, pillar of fire by night. And uh, talking about them being baptized in the cloud and the sea, right? They went through the Red Sea as the waters parted. That was their baptism, and that cloud represents the, the Holy Ghost. And, and he says they were all baptized. Even back in Moses' day, they were baptized in the cloud and in the sea. So we have this idea, and you know, that cloud enveloped them. And in fact, it stood between them and Pharaoh's army so that they could escape through the Red Sea. And so it was a baptism and, uh, of the Spirit of God on their lives. And this is that idea, this is that notion, is that, that as Jesus said, we're going to be baptized with the Holy Ghost. It's going to fall on us. It is going to... Uh, uh, you know, just literally uh, uh, be poured out upon us in a great way. And um, and so we go back to this Acts, the second chapter, as I'm, I'm going to try to wind this all and make all this make sense. And then next week we'll talk some more about Pentecost from the book of Acts and other things. But we get back to Acts, the second chapter, that initial day of Pentecost. And here's one thing I want to say, that the Holy Ghost can fall at any time, okay? Initially it fell on the day of Pentecost. But it's not restricted to that anymore. It, it, it's happening around the world on a daily basis at all hours of the days and night, okay? So it's not bound by a certain day on the calendar any longer. Um, but the initial day of Pentecost came. There were some things that happened. There was a sound from heaven. It sounded like a rushing mighty wind. And go back to, to John 3 and read what Jesus said about this. He said there's a sound that comes with being born again. And there is a sound. And he talks about the wind, okay? So there was a sound from heaven and the wind. Clothing tongues like a fire set up on each of them. Now look, the wording here is clothing tongues like as a fire. So there was something going on visually. And again, I, it doesn't always happen in the physical realm, but we don't discount it. They were all filled, right? Filled because that, that poured out upon them and they began to speak in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, so here's the deal. People from all over the world have gathered here for this high holy feast day of Pentecost. And and so they're, because the believers of Christ are in the upper room, and this spills out into the streets, and the crowd says, well, these people are drunk. You know, and so Peter, who uh, has the keys of the kingdom, and he, he begins to explain what's going on, right, in Acts, the second chapter. Because people are going, well, these people are drunk, and, and there's confusion, they know what's going on. So Peter begins preaching. And in 2.16 of Acts, he goes right back to Joel. And he says this, This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Boom. The Spirit being poured out, speaking in other tongues. And it shall come to pass in the last days, as Peter's preaching, saith God, I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, the promise of the Father. Peter preaches Joel to that audience, letting them know. Amen. And the streets are full of people, and they're preaching, amen, that God is pouring out His Spirit as He promised, the promise of the Father. Peter goes on to say in Acts 2.21, it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever. Whosoever. And the Bible said when the people that were there heard what Peter was preaching, and they heard people being filled with the Spirit, it's... They, they said to Peter and the rest of the disciples and apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Are you asking that question? Is somebody in your family asking? Is a friend asking the question, what shall I do to be saved? Peter said this, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Right? Ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And he said, every one of you, repent, be baptized. Ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Amen. For the promise is unto you, 
What promise? The promise of the Father. The promise of Joel 2.28. Uh, the promise of the Father that Jesus said in Luke 24.49. Luke 24.49, Jesus said, Go back to Jerusalem and stay there and pray until you be endued with power from on high. And he says, I will send the promise of the Father. Amen. And uh, he, Jesus said, it, I will send the promise of the Father. And so uh, we find then that they in fact... Uh, they in fact do uh, go uh, and uh, they they go back and this is what's going on and this is why Peter's preaching this, saying that the promise of the Father has come. Now, what is interesting to know is that in John 14, 26, Jesus identifies this as well. He says, when the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, right? Whom the Father will send in my name. Now, John 14, 26 occurs the night of Jesus' crucifixion. And it is also in conjunction with Luke 2, 24, 49, when Jesus, before his ascension, when he says, I'm going to send the promise of the Father. And so we couple all these verses together by Jesus, what he's teaching, and, and then what Peter says, the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as the many as the Lord our God shall call. He said it's for your children and for their children, for many... All those that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. I want you to know the Lord's still calling. God's still pouring out His Spirit. And Jesus identifies the promise of the Father as being the Holy Ghost in John 14, 26. He, he makes all the necessary connections for us today. And, and we know without a shadow of a doubt that this infilling of the Holy Ghost, amen, comes from God. It's a promise of the Father. And Jesus said that, that, that the disciples should go and tarry until they be endued with power from on high and until the promise of the Father comes. And that promise, according to Peter, has not been revoked or stopped. Some teach that tongues has ceased. Uh, I'm telling you tonight, amen. <clears throat> tongues is still, uh, the infilling of the Holy Ghost evidenced by speaking in tongues is still being poured out. The scripture that talks about tongues ceasing is, a, uh, is when the church is raptured out of here. That, that scripture also says that tongues will cease when knowledge shall cease. I got a question for you. Has knowledge ceased today? Knowledge is increasing exponentially all the time. And so, uh, no, this is still happening. As Peter said, it's going to happen, and the Lord is going to call people, and it's going to be for our children and their children, and, and, and he's not done yet. So the great thing about this is that there were 3,000 people, Acts 2.41, 3,000 people that believed and they were baptized and they were filled with the Holy Ghost on that very same day, 3,000. So this just wasn't a small band of believers on the day of Pentecost. 3,000 people from all over the world received the gift of the Holy Ghost, amen, and they would go back and they would spread this glorious gift, amen, and this glorious message of infilling of the Holy Ghost. I close tonight talking to you uh, from a report that Peter gave later on in the book of Acts. So next week I'll touch this more in detail, but know this. Peter went to the household of a man named Cornelius, and he began to teach Cornelius uh, and to his household and preach to them about this very Holy Ghost, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost. Here's what Peter says of that experience in Acts 11 and 15. Now remind you, Peter was a Jew, Cornelius was a Gentile, and so so he goes back to Jerusalem, and he gives a report, and he said this, And as I begin to speak, okay, and we'll cover this next week, the Holy Ghost fell on them, baptized them, right? The Holy Ghost baptized them, as on us at the beginning. When was the beginning? Well, for this particular instance, he's, he's referring to Acts, the second chapter, when he himself was filled with the Holy Ghost in Acts 2, 1 through 4. And he said, The Holy Ghost fell on the Gentiles while I was preaching, just like it fell on us on the day of Pentecost. It baptized them, just like it baptized us. Then he said, I, I remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said, John indeed baptized with water. We, we quoted these scriptures tonight. Now Peter's quoting them. But ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. For as, for as much then, now my Acts eleven seventeen. for as much then as God gave them the like gift. What's he talking about? The Holy Ghost, the same manner. The Gentiles received the Holy Ghost speaking in other tongues as the Spirit of God gave them the utterance. He gave, God gave them, the Gentiles, the like gift, Acts 2, 1 through 4, and Acts 2, 41, the 3,000, the like gift, as he did unto us who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. 
I don't want to offend anybody tonight, but I'm going to preach the Bible right here, right now as I close this. If you claim to be a believer, according to Jesus, according to His disciples, if we're a believer, then being filled or baptized with the Holy Ghost is a part of being a believer. Amen. So I would encourage you. He said here, we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is what had happened to us and to the Gentiles and to thousands of people. So don't just stop in your experience of being a believer. I commend you for being a believer. But I want you to know there's more for you. If you've never experienced Pentecost, not the denomination, but the experience of Acts 2 and Acts 10, amen, and Acts 19, and we're getting into some of these next week as we wind this up heading into Pentecost Sunday. If you're a believer and you've not experienced it, Amen. We don't take away from your walk with the Lord or where you're at, but just add another layer, add another experience, add another dimension, amen, to where you're at in Jesus Christ. For the promise is unto you, amen. And he's still calling today for salvation. God bless you. Thanks for joining me tonight on this Wednesday night for Bible study. Uh, again, we'll be back here tomorrow morning, 9 a.m. for morning coffee with Pastor Brian speaking on Healthy Minds. And then Memorial Day weekend will be uh, coming to you at noon with another message, a word of exhortation from the sanctuary. God bless you. Have a great evening. Trust that this has been a word of encouragement on this Wednesday night. Blessings.